welcome to iPod, UPod, MPod, episode two, where we're going to be talking with Dr. Panakin Deve, and we're going to be talking more about what the MPod actually means clinically on this episode of the OI Show. Panakin, welcome back, and thank you so much for all the information on the new science. I, I think the new handheld device is going to be very, very interesting because I think it's just going to, for, for lack of a better way to describe it, it's going to be more accessible to more clinicians. It's not going to be competing for real estate and it's going to be easy to use on the fly. So if we see someone that we want to measure, we're going to be able to measure it. But but saying all of that, um, why is MPOD an important measurement for us to have in really the contemporary eye care practice? Thank you again for having me. So macular pigment optical density is a biomarker. Simply put, meaning a suboptimal level of macular pigment could indicate risk for certain disease states. And it is one of the alterable or changeable uh, risk factors, meaning if you have a low amount of it, and if you actually manage to increase the amount in your body, then the risk declines. A simplest analogy to put, you know, there are various risk factors for glaucoma, but the more, the one alterable risk factor is intraocular pressure. You can lower IOP and expect people's uh, progression in the disease to change. Similarly, macular pigment optical density is a biomarker and an alterable biomarker, which can change the risk for various disease states. Um, and um, to name a few, we our best understanding about macular pigment comes from the fact that AMD research has shown that a suboptimal level of macular pigment can be a risk factor for AMD pathogenesis. We understand the basic science behind why the pigment is less or what depletes the pigment and why having a greater amount of pigment could actually prevent from some of the oxidative damage occurring in AMD. But the association of various disease states doesn't stop there. You know, we know that uh, there are diseases like diabetes, where sedative damage in the retina is one of the pathogenesis in leading to diabetic retinopathy. So an interesting point is the patients that have diabetes or diabetic eye disease could have lesser amount of pigment in their retina, and one could increase the pigment levels and expect a different outcome and an improvement in vision state. Um, so, other... Mark, if, if I could just pause for a second. So this is interesting stuff because we're really talking about these conditions that once they start, it's difficult to actually halt them. So once you get disease progression, it's very, very difficult to pull back. And you always look at the AMD patients that you have in your office and you ask yourself, what could we have done better? What you're saying is, Hey, listen, we have genetic risk, which we oftentimes can't do much about. We have environmental risk, which we can do something about. And macular pigment optical density is one of those environmental risk factors that we can literally reduce that risk factor by increasing MPOD. I think it's fascinating. I think it's fascinating that we can alter or reduce risk factor for disease. But you wrote probably one of the best review papers that I've ever um, uh, read on digital eye strain and this whole nutrition around this whole concept. And if you could summarize a little bit about that and what MPOD might mean to digital eye strain. Uh, thank you. Sure. Um, I, I do appreciate the compliment. So the idea that digital eye strain might have two different facets is first point that one needs to acknowledge. There is digitalized strain. You know, the, the irony is not lost that we are doing the podcast on Zoom. And, you know, by, by using these computers, we are increasing our level of uh, strain to our eye. Yeah. But digital eye strain in its current definition is uh, actually um, a ocular problem that leads to fatigue, a phenopia kind of symptoms. and the change in paradigm shift would be to acknowledge that digitalized strain, yes, although manifests as a ocular 
fatigue, asthenopia, mild headache, or strain around the neck, etc., has much more systemic component that indeed goes into uh, causing some of these issues. So, for example, if you have a poor, a mild refractive error, which you would have usually left uncorrected, the first thing to do for a person that has digitalized strain or complaints, let's say if I'm your patient and I chronically complain about fatigue by afternoon and I just don't feel right and I'm not able to work, the first thing to do would be to give me a full eye exam and probably correct these smaller features that you might have not paid attention to. So a small refractive error, a small astigmatism correction, uh, perhaps a subclinical dry eye that you know you might have said, um, it's dry, but it's like we don't need intervention right now. Those mm -hmm. things need to be corrected. And then on top of that, perhaps nutrition has a real role to play in taking care of this problem, digital eye strain. To explain to this, there is a simpler, a simple explanation. There is a more complicated explanation. Simple explanation will sound very easy and everybody will be convinced. I'll give you the simple explanation, but it's only a partial explanation. So if you can do anything to get your vision to be more enhanced, we have a better ability to counteract digital eye strain. So if I see things clear and I'm not straining my eyes to do this, to look at the screen, then perhaps my vision will, will not be so bad over an, a six to eight hour uh, working day, right? And so if you look about macular pigment, and we talked in last episode, that the pigment in the retina enhances your vision and you see things clear. Your contrast sensitivity is perhaps better. Your visual acuity is better. Your edge detection, you can see the edges very clearly. Your color vision is better. So improved vision, less strain, less asthenopia is probably an easy explanation, but it's only a partial explanation. Because I believe there, there's data that there are many systemic changes that one observes when a patient complains of digitalized strain. So thinking of systemic changes, one of the interesting parameters that is noticed is that we have uh, a poor sleep cycle when we have digitalized strain, and also the cortisol levels in our body is actually uh, increased when we are experiencing this digitalized strain. So let's start with the sleep cycle disrupted. And that's pretty easy to understand nowadays. If you are looking at screens for a very long time, the blue light in the screens or blue light, any light from the overhead or Perhaps even if you're spending too much time outside in the sun, which we don't have sunlight at 6 p.m., right? So the sun is not the real cause, but the other lighting levels are the real cause. So if you have a lot of blue light getting into the eye, then our melatonin synthesis is suppressed. And so you don't actually fall asleep quickly enough because you need to increase the melatonin synthesis for us to fall asleep as a first step. And then to keep us asleep and have a good sleep cycle, we need to actually, the melatonin part goes down, but overall the cortisol and other mechanisms need to be also suppressed for our sleep to be nicely smooth overnight. So when you are staring at screens, generally uh, at nighttime, our melatonin synthesis is suppressed, but we need more amounts of it for us to fall asleep. And so that sleep cycle is disrupted. So, Panak, and this is why some people are work well with blue light blocking glasses at night, or they feel that when I work on a computer in the evening and I wear the blue light blocking glasses, I can go to sleep easier after I work on the computer screen. Some ways, yes. Although the blue light blocking glasses has some very contradictory literature, given that the blue blockers may not be blocking the the blue spectrum as a whole, and the amount of blue light it blocks might be very little, and it may be a placebo effect, but yes, you are correctly correctly pointing out that the blue blocking may be helping some people. But think of your macular pigment as your eyes' internal sunglasses. It is blocking the blue light, right, mm -hmm. in your retina and allowing it to be present to a certain level to wake us up in the morning if need to. So we're not blocking the entire spectrum, but your body knows how to take care of itself. 
we don't need to put an extra pair of glasses or extremely tinted yellow looking lenses that almost, you know, it's not appealing. We just need to eat better, have a higher level of pigment in our retina. And when things don't work, perhaps supplements might be a, a very a systematic way to control the amount of pigment in the retina. So, so uh, in the blue blocking realm, I'd say that let your eye um, allow the light to go in, just have internal protection uh, against blue light by having a good macular pigment present. So, so Panakin, would you put that in the realm of a practitioner looking to provide better outcomes for people with digital eye strain? Is macular 100%. optical density, in your opinion, something that we should be measuring and should be optimizing for these patients? So, um, everybody is uh, up in arms and happy about AI, right? They're all excited about artificial intelligence and chat GPT. Well, guess what? That chat, not chat GPT, but uh, artificial intelligence helped us identify M as one of the biomarkers that one can actually measure. And if you have a lower level of macular pigment, optical density, you have greater chances of digitalized strain or fatigue. And this came out of thousands of various biomarkers, including blood biomarkers that they looked at, and they found that MPOD was one of the serious four biomarkers that one can measure and be able to say that you are at a greater risk for digitalized strain. Panakin, correct me if I'm wrong, but in that study, didn't they actually um, supplement with carotenoids? And then over a 90-day time period, they actually elevated MPOD levels, and there was an inverse relationship with increasing MPOD and reducing digital eye strain. Correct. Um, you have read the study, obviously, so thank you no. for doing that. And what, what was elegant about that is that uh, first part of the study looked at artificial intelligence and saying, what parameters will be predictive. And then the second part of the study looked at what levels should I be prescribing my patients? Like, you know, what levels of, of carotenoids should I really be giving them? And what they found is that about uh, 13 milligrams or, or 14 milligrams of carotenoid would be the sweet spot for about 60% of the patients. For about 30% of the patients, 10 milligram might be enough. And a three to 4% cannot be helped by just giving supplementation. You have to do other forms of things that need what we need it. But yes, you're correct that if you give carotenoids, and as I was telling you, it's a alterable biomarker, meaning if you fix this problem, the problem will overall decrease for the disease state, which is the digitalized strain. That's great. Panak, and this is, this is so interesting because we're actually getting into a space here where I think that optometry is very st strong. And that is where um, although we do manage disease and we, we do a lot of stuff to manage disease, we're also a lifestyle uh, modification profession in that we're always looking to help people function better. Contact lenses as opposed to glasses, progressives as opposed to two pairs of glasses, office lenses so they don't have to tip their head back to see computer screens. And I, I really see this as additive to our efforts in terms of making people function better. I, I, I really see that this is truly a next step. And I think that a handheld device makes it much easier for clinicians to actually do this on a regular basis. Exactly right. And in fact, uh, there have been randomized control trials that have looked at people that have used, um, that are using computers six hours or greater, which is almost everybody these days are using computers about six hours. And what they found is that patients, uh, when they supplemented to give them uh, macular xanthophils, about 13 milligrams or so, uh, up to 26, they've tried two different values. And what they found is that when they supplemented with these macular xanthophils, patient reported decreased digitalized strain by surveys, various blood biomarkers improved, they felt better, they slept better, the neck pain, et cetera. The kind of things that we just uh, put an umbrella term called asthenopia, and we don't really know what's causing it, all those symptoms went down. Uh, and so I think the handheld ZX Pro, which is just launched, should be uh, a paradigm shift and a game changer overall in this arena where we could actually in office get patients to examine the value. And if it is low, it will be a very good conversation starter. Do you feel more fatigued? Um, and sometimes you don't know uh, uh, what is a problem until somebody tells you that this is a problem because we just accept 
uh, that, oh, yeah, it's probably okay to get fatigued after two, three hours of work uh, or staring at computers. You don't have to. One of my um, professors used to always say, are you aware of your heart beating? And the answer is no. Then why should you be aware of your eyes existing? Why should your eyes burn? Or why should your eyes be fatigued? That's like saying that I'm, I'm aware that my heart is fatigued. Your heart beats continuously for lifelong. We don't feel it. So then we should not be aware of our eyes and ocular related issues. Our eyes should just function, just function. And to get to that place, I think an optometrist and an eye care provider can do a brilliant job by measuring macular pigment, supplementing appropriately, increasing the levels, and then seeing the changes in the lifestyle of the patient. The added benefit of preventing perhaps AMD-related damage, perhaps preventing uh, diabetes or metabolic syndrome issues, or the added benefit of improved vision is just bonus. All along with what you're getting is a relief of digitalized strain. Anak, and thank you. This was this was enlightening, and it certainly is changing the conversation that we're having in our office on a daily basis. And I appreciate you for being at the forefront of the research on this. Appreciate you for being on this episode, Panak, and thank you again. Thank you for having me. And thank you all for joining us for this episode of the Optometric Insights Show. 